So welcome everybody. Welcome to the African Doctoral Academy Masterclass on opportunities and resources in support of early career researchers and equitable research partnerships. My name is Natalie Kavalik. I'm the program manager at the African Doctoral Academy and I'm joined by our two guest speakers, Dr. Beate Knight and Dr. Juliana Batazzo from the Association of Commonwealth Universities. Dr. Beate Knight is head of programs at the Association of Commonwealth Universities leading a portfolio of research and education capacity, strengthening programs in collaboration with member universities and other partners. Dr. Knight has a long-standing interest in supporting and enabling international equitable research partnerships. Before joining the ACU, Dr. Knight managed the University of Essex Global Challenge Research Funding Program, which was support to collaboration international research projects, focusing on global challenges and on achieving sustainable development goals. She was also program managing the research element for the university's membership in the European Networks and the European University Alliance, and has worked in a variety of roles involving research development and research project management at UK universities. We also have our second speaker, Dr. Juliana Bertazzo, who is currently the senior membership engagement manager at the Association of Commonwealth Universities, where she connects several groups within nearly 500 member universities. Dr. Batazzo has worked for over a decade in multiple roles in non-for-profit organizations, government, higher education, science and innovation sectors. Following an international academic career as postdoctoral research associate and teaching fellow, while as an academic, she has also delivered commissional research papers, data analysis and project management for think tanks in the UK, Germany and Brazil, and has also spent two years teaching a postgraduate course at the University of Oxford. They will be speaking on the topic of opportunities for engagement with the Association of Commonwealth Universities, their work in access and inclusion, academic mobility and the SDGs, as well as international collaboration, including their newly launched Equitable Partnership Toolkit. So we welcome everybody. Um, after the session, we will also open um, the session to a Q&A. Uh, my two colleagues, Camargo and Luther, will also be assisting with the Q&A section. And just a reminder to everybody that um, we are recording the session and we will be providing a link on our website um, if you would like to view it at a later stage. So welcome, and I will now hand over the platform to our presenters, Dr. Knight and Dr. Biasso. Thank you. I think I'll go first. I Yes. Excellent. So, um, yes. Good afternoon, everyone, or where you are. Still, good morning here, but it's great to be with you. And I'll give you a little overview of uh, what the benefits are and the opportunities are for you as a member of the Association of Commonwealth University. I realize from the guest list that not everyone is based at a um, Commonwealth country or at a university that is a member of the Association of Commonwealth Universities. But it might be that if you are based at one of our member universities, you're still eligible to a lot of what I'm going to tell you about today. So I'm going to share some slides and hopefully you can see them. Let's see, full screen. Okay, are you able to see my slides? Just, yeah. Yes, perfect. Yeah, right, brilliant. So I'm telling you uh, today about the opportunities and resources in support of early career researchers available from membership of the Association of Commonwealth Universities or ACU as we call it. This is a global network of universities because Commonwealth countries are spread across every inhabited continent of the world. And we support international collaboration between these higher education institutions to tackle global challenges as in the sustainable development goals, create educational opportunities through programs and uh, uh, scholarships, fellowships and projects. And we strengthen universities in their missions now uh, by uh, engaging with everyone from vice chancellor level to professional services staff to faculty to students. And uh, so we are one of the largest university associations in the world with around 500 members in around 50 countries and a great uh, um, 
a great uh, characteristic of the Commonwealth is that we have low and middle income countries and high income countries, well resourced and less well resourced universities. So we have a great diversity of uh, our membership and we reach uh, combined audience of about 10 million students of which you are part and about 1 million academic and professional staffs. So we're uh, spread across Africa, Asia, Caribbean, Americas, Europe and Pacific, as I mentioned. And you are a student member of the ACU if you are an ACU member university and you have access to all these opportunities that I'll tell you about today. So why would you engage with the ACU? To connect um, to um, our staff, students, across the Commonwealth to learn from one another and to influence policy. How do we do that? We have accredited status as the only um, uh, higher education institution accredited uh, to talk on behalf of the Commonwealth. So we have representation at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting at the Conference of uh, Education Ministers of the Commonwealth and also at UNESCO and at the United Nations. Uh, we go and uh, speak at this forum every opportunity we have every year at UNESCO and the UN and every time the heads of government meet. So we um, uh, have been uh, able recently to um, make sure that the importance of higher education, not just basic education, is recognized at the highest levels by the heads of government and the education ministers in the Commonwealth. And we're uh, we've been uh, taking our members, and this is um, a lecturer. Well, this is not her photo. I have a, a slide with her own photo. Uh, but uh, she uh, has been our representative of the ACU in COP27. So we go to COP every time they meet. And uh, we um, last time we were represented by our future climate research cohort. And uh, Beth can tell you a bit more about that because that's her area of programs. And I'll just leave it at this. But the Commonwealth is really um, a place where two out of every three people that are young people in the world are living and two thirds of the Commonwealth are under the age of 30. So this is the year of the youth in the Commonwealth. And last year, just last week, we've had a meeting of um, youth ministers uh, here in London and uh, we've had awards for um, people in the Commonwealth that have been really active, have been active in issues that matter to other young people in the Commonwealth as well. We have all these opportunities for representation of young people in the Commonwealth, and I do encourage you to take part if you can. And uh, what we also do, uh, besides the representation and influencing policy, is build capacity in our member universities through networks and communities, looking at our global network to support sustainable development goals and share expertise and resource around key thematic areas. And we also have a benchmarking tool for members that I'll tell you more about later. So we have five thematic networks that uh, are open to researchers such as yourselves and around areas that are very um, relevant for the Commonwealth. So that cut across the membership. Uh, and we are going to tell you, I'm going to tell you quickly about them. They're member led. They have their own budget so they can organize their conferences, support projects that um, would uh, be uh, disseminated for learnings across uh, the membership and they would also uh, be able to give awards and grants. So we have good numbers uh, for each of these uh, thematic networks and the themes are peace and reconciliation, climate resilience, uh, the sustainable development goals, uh, human resources in higher education and supporting research community. And this supporting research function goes from libraries. We have recently had the um, University of Johannesburg library conference that we support every year to finance officers and uh, people such as Natalie and uh, 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 Mampo that uh, uh, support research also at Ada. So for peace and reconciliation, a major event uh, that happened this year was the summer school that we had for students at Stellenbosch University hosted by Stellenbosch. Uh, and uh, we had a record number of applications and we had sponsorship from other member universities to have their students uh, placed in this program with match funding. And so we had um, students coming from all over the Commonwealth from 
to uh, be in multicultural groups, looking at apartheid to transitional justice, and also bringing their own perspectives coming from New Zealand or Canada, talking about First Nations and reconciliation and justice processes connected with that. And uh, it was a huge success and we're very proud of it. For climate resilience, uh, a highlight is uh, the, um, the, the challenge grants, which highlight uh, basically and give support, funding support to uh, members who have innovative projects in their institutions or a, through international collaboration that could be disseminated for learnings. So we have this example of um, a person who was awarded a challenge grant from the Commonwealth Climate Resilience Network. And uh, from the Higher Education and the Sustainable Development Goals Network, we have um, a note from the Special Advisor, which is Professor Bert Hall from Victoria University in Canada. And he was able to have a vision for Commonwealth universities that we see everywhere. Commonwealth universities are engaged, decolonizing, community oriented and a place of action. They're less worried about rankings and more worried about the impact they have in the world. And by doing so, they really build this uh, momentum around them. So that's what we want to see as a result of uh, these networks. And for the Human Resources in Higher Education Network, we've had a series of events uh, that this was last year around adapting to the new world of working, emerging from the pandemic, flexible working, remote working. So they exchanged uh, uh, ideas and uh, talked about the challenges for HR departments everywhere. And for supporting research community, we've had the launch of ACU measures, which is a survey that uh, allows universities themselves to better understand how they're dealing with challenges uh, across uh, funding and the, the life cycle of bidding for awards and uh, supporting researchers, training researchers, and then looking at gender gaps and looking at a lot of different elements of the supporting research function. And I'm going to tell you a little, I'm going to show you a bit of what it looks like. So this uh, is an example of a dashboard that came out of uh, about 100 universities across the membership re replying to our call for answering the survey. And uh, we're looking at a mix of diverse universities and uh, by public and private universities, other kind of universities. So in uh, 29 countries and we learned so much from this. I'm not it's an anonymous uh, survey, so we're not ranking individual universities. We're looking at trends that apply to uh, areas or apply to type of universities. So this is the general overview of all the, respond the responses that we've got. And then looking at Africa in particular, so we have how the uh, career development provided is provided. Is it through training or workshop provision? Is provision of uh, sabbaticals or mentoring schemes? Is there dedicated support for the career researchers? So you can learn a lot also about how university uh, values research uh, in as a whole in the system. And you also have uh, ideas around the number of publications and how this is uh, a criterion for promotions or for research targeted targets within the universities and looking specifically at Africa, number of PhD degrees awarded, value of grants. So there's a lot that we can learn from this survey and I can talk more about it in questions if you like. It was also very much talked about in the media. And uh, I can talk about general uh, findings of the survey as well, if you like. Uh, but this supports our networks because uh, the universities themselves are able to learn about the research function across departments and institutes and different units. They have a whole view of how research is supported in the university. And they also look at regional activities, you know, looking at how this varies from region to region, from country to country, if we have enough data on country. And uh, this will this is open all year, so universities can always uh, give us the information and access the dashboard. I'm coming back to you, a view of the ACU and I'll leave partnerships and programs to my colleague uh, Beate.
but um, we have partners uh, that you can see in the slide that we work with and uh, that uh, help to deliver capacity everywhere in collaboration with other members. And I'm going to focus on you students and how you can get involved with uh, the ACU through the opportunities that we offer. So um, there is a, a Commonwealth Scholarships Commission for which the ACU provides uh, the administration of the grants. And these are a selection of grants available for low, middle and high income countries. And uh, one good example that I really like uh, is the split side PhD scholarships. I chose to highlight this one because it gives PhD students anywhere in the Commonwealth an opportunity to go to the UK for 12 months and to ask, access research uh, equipment or research um, um, uh, resources, archives or any uh, uh, opportunity for collaboration that's time limited and then students go back to their country and but the collaboration stays on. It's something that you carry on, but uh, avoiding the brain drain, if you will. And we can talk more about it as well. But this has been, um, yeah, uh, South Africa is one of the top countries for split side uh, PhD scholarships. So I thought I'd bring that to your attention, but also available to any uh, uh, student, PhD student in the Commonwealth. And uh, there's the Routledge Roundtable Commonwealth PhD Studentships. And I'm particularly fond of this scheme because uh, you don't even have to have uh, the Commonwealth as a topic of your PhD. You could be studying something else, but what you get from this studentship is a commissioned research paper in a Routledge journal that's called Roundtable. So it's a massive achievement for a PhD student to get published before the end of your PhD and in a very uh, widely recognized journal. So you would have to work on a paper uh, um, on a, uh, this academic peer reviewed article that uh, you get funding for it. And then you get a mentor that's also funded uh, for the duration of the award and uh, you get published. So it just ticks all the boxes uh, and uh, it's really exciting to see. It's mostly around the humanities, but also uh, around public health. You can give if you can give a Commonwealth angle to the research that you're doing, you will be eligible to apply. And we have Com Queen Elizabeth Commonwealth Scholarships, and uh, these are uh, unique in the sense that they promote uh, mobility from anywhere in the Commonwealth to select low and middle income countries. Um, it's a two master's degree also, so it's a, a master's by research in some countries or an MPhil. And you are studying overseas in this uh, host, uh, low and middle income Commonwealth country, and you have to be uh, involved in your community, just like what we want for Commonwealth universities. You have to have uh, engagement locally to the country you're going to and then to the country you come from. So the uh, fellow, the scholarships are really generous. They cover all tuition fees, living allowance. You know, they give you a stipend for uh, the two years that you engage, the return economy flights and a one off arrival allowance for settling in and also research support for any research costs uh, you can include in your application. Countries currently hosting QECS scholars, as we call them, um, are those in the slide. And if you are a citizen or hold a refugee status in a Commonwealth country, you're eligible to apply. If you have uh, completed the, under, under, the undergraduate degree in your country or another country with a second class division honours or about a pass uh, in uh, a South Africa, for instance, you can apply. And do learn more from the website. I'll share the slides also with uh, the people who have um, registered to attend and Natalie, you can get that from Natalie as well. And finally, our own ACU grants and fellowships. I'll be quick to cover these. Um, we as a, um, uh, an association are also a charity or a non-profit and we give out about £700,000 every year across a range of schemes. So there are, these are the schemes that we have for early career researchers. We have a uh, scheme supporting research visits and uh, we have a uh, provision for the research management staff to provide training to uh, early career researchers. And we have conference grants and the fellowships that I mentioned. We have challenge grants connected to our thematic work in the networks and communities. And uh, we have gender grants, uh, both administered by the ACU on behalf of the Martha Farrell uh, Foundation and our own gender grants for uh, our gender initiatives that I can tell you more also in questions if you like.
And one program that I'd like to highlight that is not one that uh, Beate is highlighting, hopefully we're not repeating ourselves, but this is uh, the Commonwealth Virtual Exchange Program, which is also a commitment to enabling people who have uh, who are unable to travel and go abroad and stay for a, a period of time. We're uh, providing virtual mobility and then they can meet people around their home country, but uh, meet others online. Uh, they might have um, you know, care responsibilities or other commitments that uh, prevent them from taking this opportunity, but with this program they can. It's a collaboration across uh, countries with a member, uh, members universities in different continents, and we were able to focus on employability and leadership skills, listening to our members. They asked us to prepare students to be job creators, not, job see not just job seekers when they graduate. And uh, I wanted to give a bit of overview about ACU in South Africa, but I think I'll leave it at that. You know, we've had a number of visits. Uh, we've met with National Research Foundation and we looked into uh, partnerships with Arua and looking into uh, supporting a number of initiatives uh, when we visited. And this is our representation in South Africa. We have members uh, from South Africa in our uh, governance units as well and in the supporting research network. And a regional representative based in Nigeria, but who travels around Africa also on our behalf. And uh, in the past five years, we've had a number of our awards and scholarships given in South Africa, about 62 awards uh, in the past five years across a range of schemes. And finally, I want to talk about the difference that we make as an association of Commonwealth universities can be, fair, can be seen across uh, access and inclusion, across international mobility and a commitment to sustainable development goals. And you can get involved. So I uh, would be pleased to talk to you about these opportunities, but I'll pass on at the moment for to my friend uh, Beate and my colleague to talk about uh, programs and our equitable partnerships toolkit. Thank you very, very much. Beata, we can hand it over to yourself now. Yes, so, so are we going to keep the uh, questions and answers to the end? I think ideally we're going to do that. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A section or the chat, and from there we will um, address them. Uh, there has been some people that have asked, um, would it be possible to get this presentation after the session? Um, so hopefully we can maybe share that with them later. Yes, yeah, we can um, share share our slides. Um, can you see the slides? Um, yes, I put they, on? perfect. We can see them yes. very clearly. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, um, Juliana, for giving an overview of, of all the uh, work the ACU is doing. Um, my name is Beate Knight. I'm the um, head of programs here at the ACU. So my team is looking after programs. We are um, developing together with our members um, uh, to benefit uh, our members. And these are um, programs um, mainly in the area of research capacity strengthening and education capacity strengthening. I'm not going to talk too much about the details because actually those programs are developed with our partners. Our partners are either, uh, our member universities are either technical universities, uh, technical partners or um, uh, 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 fellows from those universities can benefit from the programs. But at the moment there is nothing um, none of those programs are open for new entries, so I thought I'll, I'll concentrate on the um, equitable research partnership work job. Just to say that um, research capacity strengthening involves uh, mainly the work we do involves um, um, working with early career researchers in the area of climate change adaptation and uh, mitigation. So we are um, uh, having uh, fellowships funded by the British Council, for instance, at the moment, that helps early career researchers to work with policymakers and stakeholders very early on uh, along the research life cycle to make sure that um, research is informed by uh, current challenges policymakers have, and there's a close collaboration to ensure that there's actually impact from research. And uh, there's a 
a range of skills required for that, and that's what we're concentrating on on our um, research capacity strengthening work. And in terms of education capacity strengthening, we have funding from the Australian government to work at the moment to work with the universities in West Africa, in Ghana, and Nigeria, work with academic staff there to move from 100% um, uh, face-to-face teaching to blended learning, where digital content is provided to, to help to have a blended um, teaching mode, to deal with um, a larger student numbers, but also to, um, yeah, to move into the 21st century and um, increase the, the interaction face-to-face -face and move from pure classroom-based um, teaching. But what I wanted to do today is um, to talk to you about a toolkit we recently developed um, that is supporting our member universities or researchers in general to, to develop equitable uh, research partnerships. Um, so supporting equitable research partnerships is a, is a, is a big goal um, for, the, um, uh, for our association because, as you've heard, we have quite a diverse membership Base. We want to um, support our university to universities to collab collaborate with each other, and that um, uh, involves quite um, a number of different universities and different locations with different funding backgrounds. And um, we want to ensure that those collaborations are equitable. And so we do a lot of policy work around equitable partnership um, generation, um, but we also wanted to actively to support our member universities. Because um, universities are increasingly conducting research and collaboration with international partners to tackle the global challenges we all face. And um, these international research co collaborations can help optimize knowledge creation and impact and help, help, help to improve the quality and relevance of research. But those um, diverse international collaborations come uh, with a unique set of considerations and challenges, particularly around uh, power imbalances and inequity in planning and implementing the research in disseminating research impact. So um, that has been recognized by a lot of organizations across the world and a growing body of guidelines and principles have been developed that call for increased equity and in partnerships. But um, we found um, through our work that to date a little advice on how to translate those principles into um, action and into tangible activities um, uh, is lacking. And that's why we decided to move towards developing a toolkit. Um, and just to just to give you a, just to go uh, back and give you a bit of context. So in June 2021, we worked with the um, African Research University Alliance and the UK Research Innovation Partnership and um, developed a joint community on UK research partnerships adding to the guidelines that are so that are already out there. Um, we also um, uh, and then we oops, sorry. Um, we also recently signed the Africa Charter for Transformative Research Collaborations in Africa, um, which has been developed by the University of Cape Town, the University of South Africa and the Perivali Africa Research Centre at the University of Bristol, which is very much focusing on um, transforming collaborations between North and South um, uh, universities and ensuring and, and funders and uh, the whole ecosystem um, uh, and recommendations to, to ensure equity around those collaborations. And what we would like to do with our toolkit is to support um, the, um, so support the implementation of those equitable uh, partnerships. And what we've done um, uh, in August 2021, we commissioned a scoping study into supporting research and what we can do uh, along our, with our member universities to, to get there. And this scoping study identified the issue that there's a lot of guidelines out there, but little practical, practical support. So that then led us in August 2022 to commission um, the development of an equitable research partnership toolkit. And I really would like to thank um, here um, Michelle Breer and uh, Pink Shabanu, who's been then working with us to develop this toolkit. Um, and Michelle, she is a participatory health and development research and writing specialist with a PhD in public health, and she has extensive experience in implementing complex mixed method social science research in low and middle income countries. Um, her aim is to understand how community contexts in which health and development interventions are implemented influence participatory processes and um, how their expected and unexpected health and development incomes are, outcomes are influenced. And she has written extensively about the ethics of participatory and partnership research and the power dynamics 
projects that underpin, underpin women's participation in unpaid informal caregiving to promote health. And Michelle is currently working as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. And then Pinky is an early childhood educator and researcher who has worked herself uh, in a lot of global North-South programs and uh, in community academic research partnerships. And she started her research career in 2012 as a community co-researcher and activist uh, and is now um, working as a research assistant. And she works very closely with um, Michelle. And as you can see, both are, were highly qualified to, uh, to, to work with us to develop that um, equitable uh, partnership toolkit and uh, we worked on this in 22 23 and then the toolkit was la launched uh, this year in april and uh, what uh, what was the actual uh, methodology uh, which was applied so pinky and um, michelle informed uh, a range of stakeholder consultations so it's worked with seven academics um, with qualitative interviews and uh, six out of those seven academics were from the global south and um and also worked with uh, 10 senior stakeholders on equitable partnership uh, program, and for instance, from the UK CDR uh, program here in the UK. And also uh, both um, uh, performed an uh, extensive literature review on equity and partnerships and uh, worked with 30 prominent resources. There's an uh, example of this there. Um, oh, I can't. Sorry, I can't now. Move my slides. Apologies. Can you still hear me? We can hear you perfectly clear. Okay. There we go. Now that there we go. Just, just got stuck. A second. <laughs> yeah. So, so in the literature review and also um, the uh, stakeholder interviews and also a survey um, uh, which we performed, which had one hundred responses across um, north and south. Um, uh, uh, regionalities um, showed that there is a considerable and abstract guidance about equitable partnerships and there is a lack of practical tools. So basically the, the survey and uh, the, the research um, uh, confirmed our, um, our observations, but we wanted to make sure it's not just um, um, us here at the ACU who had this uh, um, feeling. And so it's again stuck. Not sure. Apologies. We, we're going to see what we can do also on our side. Um, oh, no. So just just um, uh, during the research, um, uh, existing guidance, um, uh, the whole range of existing guidance was um, was collated, and I just have here um, on the slides um, various. Um, uh, resources that were found, um, but this guidance was was um was um a lot in the health um health research space and also um it was um it didn't really include uh, practical tools but i just let let have a few here for you to look at sorry i'm struggling with my powerpoint um so what did we then decide to do so we decided to do, to do adapt existing uh, tools because there are a lot of participatory participatory learning tools out there. There are a lot of generic partnership tools out there. And what um, what we decided to do is um, uh, build on existing um, uh, tools out there and making sure that they are particularly focused on research partnerships, on international north south research partnerships, and um, with a particular focus on equity. And um, so when we used um, existing tools and adapted them for our toolkit, um, we made sure that we um, uh, shared um, this information with the authors of those toolkits and also had them review them so to see that they are still happy um, with the way we are using the tools and also how we adapted it to, uh, to our equity angle. And um, all authors were, were happy and, of course, um, very happy to have their tools used in a different context. And um, we developed 20 tools that uh, can be used at different stages of a research partnership. Um, the focus is very much on North-South, as I said before, but actually there's a lot of equity issues in other uh, collaborations. So um, when uh, academics work with community actors or in multidisciplinary and other research partnership contexts, um, so those tools can be used here as well. But our focus is really on North-South uh, collaboration. And um, 
the uh, these toolkits can be used by everyone who's involved in um, uh, in the collaboration of um, in research collaborations, so that are researchers, obviously, but it can also involve the project managers, practitioners that are involved, and also community actors. It can be used by research support staff, but we also feel it can be used by funders to ensure that equity is very much um, at the forefront of everyone's mind, uh, even when funding calls are being um, established. Um, our tools are designed to stimulate dialogue and critical thinking and to raise awareness about um, multiple dimensions of equity for funders to better understand the meaning of equity from different perspectives. Um, and also looking at multiple factors that influence um, equity in a positive and a negative way. But what um, very much uh, underpins all our tools that there are actions that can, can be taken and can be identified to enhance equity and partnership. And so all the 20 tools can be used very flexible, uh, can be decided on by each collaboration, which tools to use and when to use it. And we need to make sure that uh, to decide to identify tools that are best suited for their partnership. And, um, and we also um, um, have in, uh, included instructions to, to use it very quickly or to use it in a very intensive way, just to make it sure it's really usable. Um, so we um, developed 20 tools um, and have always, and they are um, structured in the same way and have a section on why and when to use the tool, how to use the tool, um, has rapid and intense use options. And also we have different instructions for using it uh, in a face-to-face, -face, um, uh, in a face-to-face -face way or virtually. Particularly in a North-South collaboration, often it's really difficult to get everyone in the same room. And also, um, we always have instructions showing what are the expected outputs and what the expected outcomes of using the tool. And here's an overview. As I said before, um, we have tools that can be used in, at different um, uh, time points in a collaboration, and we have um, structured the tools so it's um, um, possible to see it right away uh, when to use it. So um, uh, section one are for tools that um, are focused on building understanding and awareness of equity within the research collaborations. There are a lot of different actors working together with different backgrounds, and uh, it's very important to, to define um, right at the start of a partnership what everyone understands uh, under equity, and then maybe come to a common understanding across the board. Section two is um, uh, looking at stakeholder identification and analysis. Who do we need to have um, in, in our partnership to reach our research goals and supports this, and then also supports equity around the stakeholder interaction. And then section three is looking at an envision, envisioning, achieving, and assessing, assessing um, the desired partnership impact and has um, three tools under this section. Then um, section four is looking at um, uh, research study design and implementation. So once funding has been achieved, how can we um, achieve equity uh, during the implementation of the project? There are five tools there. And then section five looks at monitoring, evaluation and learning. So these are uh, tools particularly suited to looking at did we do everything to achieve equity and um, what have we learned if we didn't quite get there and what can we do better next? And then section six is a, a list of checklists that can be used, which are particularly practical. And then, oops, sorry. Um, and then also um, each tool then um, has again, I, I showed the different six sections, but then each tool then also has recommendation when within the research life cycle, it's best suited to be used. So that, um, and we put these research life cycle into four stages. That's the planning stage, the implementing stage, the disseminating stage, and the sustaining stage. And then each tool has, um, has a rating on uh, when it is best used. So in this case, it's best used at the planning and at the sustaining um, stage. And so this is all a very abstract. What I wanted to do is to actually show you um, our toolkit, which is available on our website. And so I just have to, and I also have the link. So when we are sharing the files, you'll be able to access it. And I hope I get to the website now as well. There we go. 
um, when you follow this link, this is um, uh, the site that is then opening. It gives again a, a short overview of um, our toolkit. How did we get there? And then an overview of the different uh, tools I showed you so far. And then you can actually go in into the tools. And I just show you um, one of one of the first tools. Um, and that is the Equity Cafe. It's built on the uh, it's built on the World Cafe. It's tool one. You can see that here, Equity Cafe. Um, it's very. This is a tool that can be used to um, to really discuss equity um, within the partnership. What does everyone um, understand under equity? And it's um, I'm sure all of you have been in a World Cafe before. Um, it's essentially a way to bring people together um, and discuss um, a common topics. In this case, it's equity. Um, you, let's say you have 20 participants, you split them across different tables and then have different discussion points uh, on each table. Participants move around and uh, at the end, um, it can be um, uh, discussed and uh, and uh, different issues can be um, highlighted there. And just uh, as you can see here, we explain how, how to set up this um, equity cafe. It can be uh, in a room, but it can also be virtually. And then we have a guidance on what, what different themes can be discussed. Sorry, I hope I don't make you all dizzy here looking through. Uh, what different themes can be discussed on each table and I just hope I get there just to show it to you here. So um, so the overall discussion uh, in this tool one would be what is that equity? What can equity look like? And uh, and then, as I said, um, there are different tables or breakout room if it's uh, if it is um, a virtual um, way and um, different Discussion points um, for each table could be um, capacity building. How can you capa build capacity to ensure equity? What means equity in terms of authorship? What in terms of authorships for publications? This is something we find uh, should be discussed really early on. What is equity? What means equity in terms of data ownership? Who owns the data um, uh, that are generated as part of the partnership? Where are they being stored? Who has access to the data? Really important to discuss that early on. Um, research agreements, um, um, discuss how equity can be uh, reached as part of um, uh, the research agreements. Um, um, inequalities, what are potential inequalities? How can they be highlighted? Um, how can they be um, reduced? And then, um, Equity in terms of communication, making sure that everyone has the right channels of communication that that reaches everyone involved in the partnership, then and also funding. How can we make sure that there is equity in funding, and also how can we make sure there is equity around data? So, so there is a lot of different topics that can be discussed. Everyone in the partnership is contributing to um, uh, to the understanding around those different topics. Everyone has the ability to. To, um, to contribute to the different points that are collated, and then everyone hears um, everyone's standpoint. That's the really important bit. And uh, it sounds very basic, but often that's not being discussed. Often a, a consortium is thrown together because a funder requires um, certain partners, and all those issues are not being discussed. And this is the way to do it in a very transparent and open way. But then you might say, oh, this is not very. And, and then uh, at the end of the day, obviously, every table um, has uh, ends up with a, a sticky note and then um, uh, everyone sees what has been discussed on this table and um, the main points are then agreed on and everyone uh, that can be circulated. But this is still all quite abstract. I just wanted to show you another tool and I hope um, we still have time to do this. Are we OK with time? We have plenty of time, so continue. <laughs> um, I just uh, wanted to show you another tool, which is in section five, looking at monitoring and evaluation. But um, it actually ends up with an Excel spreadsheet. As I talked about tools, um, I wanted to show you how this looks like. Um, it's just one of those. And just to say that all those um, uh, so this is not uh, just a web page you can look at, at. You can also and just have to jump to it. Um, there are um, tools you can download and work with them. So this is tool 17. It looks at partnership equity. 
And this is uh, uh, just a different way to collate um, uh, information um, from each partner and how they view equity across different um, topic areas. And I just wanted to show you here that you can actually um, uh, download a template, which you then fill in as part of the partnership. And I just can you st can you see what I've downloaded here? On yes. the download, yeah. It's can you see an Excel spreadsheet? Not, not yet. yet. You have to you have to share the spreadsheet. Also. Okay, I go back. There we go. Me struggling with technology. I go out here, and um, as you've seen, I downloaded that spreadsheet. And partners are filling this in. So this can be done. Um, ideally, this is done. Um, every partner fills this in um, individually, and then partners meet either in person or virtually to go through um, the spreadsheet together and identify areas that can be uh, improved. And um, this is this is a way to to assess um, the equity um, uh, that exists across those different partner across different criteria. And you can see here um, we've shown shown here criteria around purpose, the impact, and then there are questions underneath uh, underneath this. So under um, uh, purpose, for instance, are our partnering goals, values, and objectives clearly articulated? Then um, uh, the partner looks at this question and uh, looks at and gives it a score. Um, saying no is zero to yes fully. And then there's another question, where, where the goals, values and objectives agreed up and through a process involving northern and southern partners? Again, it can be assessed by the partner. Everyone, ideally everyone in this partnership fills this in. Then there's a, a section on impact. Is the partnership delivering the excess, expected results? Are the results and impacts relevant to the southern research partners? And is there an equitable balance of results and impacts for northern and southern partners? Then there is a question around value. There's a question around governance. Were the roles, responsibility and work processes agreed up and documented jointly? And then there's a question around leadership. I think I hope you get the gist there. For instance, there is a, a criteria seven resources. Are there sufficient financial and human resources and facilities for the partnership to deliver on expectations? Have resources been equitably distributed or are resources being developed through the partnership that will strengthen the academic, Southern academic partners capacity to, dis, to conduct research? And then there's uh, questions around process. You can see study design and authorship. And then uh, scores are given. Here we have an example from a northern partner and then a southern partner has has um, has filled that in and then there is a score comparison and then there is a spider gram here and here you can see um, the closer to zero the lower the equity the further away from zero the higher the equity and it's really interesting in this example here the southern partner felt equity isn't very uh, very um, uh, much developed within the partnership, whereas the northern partner um, actually thought, oh, it's all going very well. And then this this spider gram can be a start of a discussion and looking at the different issues. And then also what what we can then do is uh, develop comments and um, and also develop actions on how to increase equity. And then this spider gram can be used at the beginning of a of a partnership and then can be used throughout and at the end. And there you can you are able, they have something in your hand tangible to look at um, has there been progress or not. And also it's a way to identify issues. So I just uh, and as I said um, on the web page, um, there are detailed uh, instructions on how to use the tool, some examples and and guidance. And um, I know it's it, it's quite a lot to take in. The website is also quite a lot to, to take in. There's a lot of information we wanted to collate. And um, what we are working on now is to see if we can work with our um, partner universities and um, run workshops um, at universities, either with existing uh, consortia or also what we are really interested in uh, is working with research um, support staff, research managers at our partner universities who um, train them in the use of those tools, who can then work with their academics at universities to support them, um, should they be involved in partnerships, to, to use those tools, to bring them to the table, to discuss issues which can be quite difficult, especially if the funding comes from a northern university uh, or from a northern funder. There are certain conditions attached to it, but we feel it's 
still very important to talk about the partnership, uh, data analysis, ownership of ownership of um, data, um, um, ownership of um, uh, intellectual property, and there are tools along uh, all those aspects uh, in our toolkit. And I think I stop here, and I hope um, I have given you a bit of an insight on how this can be used. Thank you so much, Beata. It's uh, I think it gave a lot of incitement into exactly um, how the toolkits work. Um, and also, Juliana, thank you so much for your presentation, also on the opportunities. I think a lot of our members um, didn't maybe know that there were members of the Association for Commonwealth Universities. So we do have a lot of questions that have come in. So I'm going to invite my two colleagues, um, Kamakello and Luther, to address those questions. And so, Kama, would you like to just ask a few questions and we can start getting it rolling? I uh, thank you so much for that informative session. Um, so there is a couple of questions. I think the first one I'll start with is regarding uh, there's somebody who's asking, is NAST a university in Namibia, a member of the ACU? So they are from the University of Science and Technology in Namibia. Take that one. Yeah, we at the moment, only the University of Namibia is a member, but uh, I'm going to put it on the chat here, uh, a page with uh, where you can search our members. So uh, then you can, uh, yeah check for yourselves if you have any other questions of this kind. Sure. Um, so the next question is from Chira, and they're asking, are there any grants for early career researchers or academics to develop, to develop postgraduate programs initially through split degrees between an African university and ACU? Yeah, the one that I've mentioned was a split side PhD uh, between UK universities and universities anywhere in the Commonwealth. Uh, so the there is a difference between the Association of Commonwealth Universities, that is the first association of universities in the world and the oldest and the one that's still running. It's 110 years old. We started before the Commonwealth was established as a secretariat under a different name and then carried on 110 years old this year. Uh, but uh, the Commonwealth Scholarships Commission is um, a result of funding that has been uh, endowed to um, these uh, multi-country commission and uh, they've given uh, funding to support you know, mainly the UK but also uh, Canada, other countries, they have uh, given funding to support exchange uh, within the, the Commonwealth and uh, what we do is we administer the grants as a CEO, we are the secretariat and administer the grants on behalf of the commission and also do monitoring and evaluation and a full cycle around these grants. But for the Commonwealth scholarships and fellowships plan, what happens is anywhere in the Commonwealth could be a member association, a member university or not uh, of the Association of Commonwealth Universities, you are eligible to apply for the Commonwealth scholarships and fellowships. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think that answers one of the questions where somebody asked if they are not affiliated with an institution, can they still apply for any opportunities? Yeah, for Commonwealth AC? scholarships and fellowships. Yeah, sure. the Queen Elizabeth uh, Com uh, scholarships, uh, Commonwealth Scholarships Commission, split side PhDs, full PhDs, masters, masters uh, by distance learning. They have a great uh, menu of offers. I just highlighted one uh, for for ease and uh, for for time and the interest of time. But you do, uh, I'll put their website over here as well in the chat so that you can explore the very uh, several opportunities they have. Oh, it's just a question from us. Like, how do you define an early career scholar? Is it somebody who has a PhD, or would it be somebody who is still doing their masters or PhD? Like, how do you distinguish between people who are postgrads or were still developing also as early career. What is an early career scholar? Okay. Okay, so we have, yeah. Okay, I'm going to, yeah, for different programs, different uh, definitions, but I'm going to leave here for the, uh, there'll be masters and PhDs, postgraduates for the Commonwealth Scholarships uh, Commission. And uh, let me just, Put this one here before I forget. 
and uh, there's the Commonwealth Scholarships and Fellowships plan as well. But then Beata can mention for individual programs. But here we're talking about masters and PhDs. Yes, I think um, uh, Juliana, you're absolutely right. It depends on the program, uh, the definition of around okay. early career researchers. So for our fellowships, for instance, um, we define early career as um, um, having a PhD uh, and um, in most cases um, or equivalent experience, but it's not by years um, necessarily. It's depending on the qualification. OK, um, so I have a question for Beata. So I think a couple, so if somebody, I think you mentioned something regarding the toolkit about an equity cafe. So I'm just wondering like if the equity cafe, is that something about it, an equity cafe where people oh, sit together? Yes, an equity cafe. So I'm wondering like for an early career scholar who doesn't necessarily have, or who doesn't have, who still start starting up within their careers. So like, how is it best to actually get access to those cafe? Because initially for to form partnerships, if you still, if you just graduated from a PhD, you obviously do not know so many people. Like how does the equity cafe work in itself? Does, can one join from a member country and just to get exposed to different partners or do they have to source out a partner themselves and then start using the toolkit? Yes, yeah, so I think, um. So the equity cafe is just a tool that it's not not a thing itself. It's just a tool partners can use. It's it's a way to to um, stimulate discussions within existing partnerships to to discuss equity in terms of how as an early career researcher, how do you um, actually um, start collaborations and how do you get into a collaboration? I would say, yes, that's a diff that's that's um it's an earlier step and uh i guess in a way our fellowship our scholarship to fellowships help this by by having a mobility element to go to someone else's group to and then work let's say you're an early career researcher in someone else's group make sure that you're involved in in those partnerships and discussions and and get exposure um this way I would say what we really uh, would like to do is, um, as I mentioned before, work with partner universities, work with research management support staff to to um, to demonstrate how the tools can work. And um, I think then that would be a way um, for researchers at those universities to join those demonstrations and, and, and to get exposure to that. But all those tools are really not a way to identify new partners, I have to say. Um, but you can identify them through other uh, programs and through your own work and working with senior colleagues um, and, and make sure that they include you into larger collaborative projects. So there's also a question from Mam Pelletualo, and they were asking whether as a student to a member university, you just automatically have access to a thing. I quickly went to a website. Can one just go to the website, download the toolkit, as do you, you don't have to sign in on anything. If you want the toolkit, you can just access it. Absolutely. So this is uh, this is not just open to a member university. Anyone can go to our website, uh, follow the link, um, have a look at the tools and also do download um, elements of the tool. At the moment, we don't have a PDF that collates. All, as you've seen, there is quite a lot in there. <laughs> we don't have a PDF yet that can be downloaded, especially because there are then links to Excel spreadsheets or other PDFs. So the best way is to look at the website and then look go into that sway side and look at individual tools but yes please feel free to use it we really want it to be um used by by research um, researchers and also what we would like to do have a bit more of a focus program where we work with existing collaborations to evaluate and monitor the effectiveness of those tools so that's a piece of work um we want to do in the next few months um so i'm asking this question i think a couple of people are asking also with regarding uh, conferences and if there's funding for that. So if I'm a PhD student, can I get apply for funding to attend a conference from the ACU? And do you have exchange programs concerning their research projects? Can does one have to find an ideal supervisor from a partner institution and then apply for a an exchange program or does it have like research structured exchange programs offered by ACU itself? 
Okay, so I've uh, I've included here um, a definition. You know, this is the most restrictive that we have. It's ACU Early Career Conference grants. So applying for funding to attend a conference and or organize a conference, it could be. But then this would be researchers or academics at ACU member universities who are within seven years of the start of their research or teaching career, unless they've had a break uh, and they can tell us about it. They can be PhD candidates as well. Uh, but they must be employed because this is for organizing a conference or attending a conference. And so this is the most restrictive one. But then the others will tell you if you are a PhD student or not. So we have an overview and we're going to publish very soon. You know, we have an overview of our funding opportunities um, here. And uh, I'm going to put it on the chat as well. So you can see it before you even get the slides. But um, yeah, so in re response to the question, yes, you can apply for funding to uh, attend the conferences and you can also join our networks. So like I said, the networks are member led. They are governed by steering committees elected uh, from people who decide to join the thematic networks. And uh, if you can align your work to a sustainable development goal or if your work is aligned with peace and reconciliation, with climate uh, research, climate change, resilience, all of this, you know, you, you're welcome to join. There's no cap to the number of people from member universities who can join our networks and communities. And um, uh, basically, yes, they support uh, attend attendance to conferences. You know, you can make the case that your attendance to a conference will be uh, disseminating uh, best practices and learnings across the network. So they do have their own funding and they have um, um, support for people attending conferences. But we also have this line of funding that is restricted to early career researchers applying to attend a conference or to organize a conference. There's a question from Teresa. I don't know if you can read it inside. I'm struggling to comprehend it. It says, are there funding for students reaching corruption, nepotism and dynamics of leaderships? PhDs, I, I, I can't follow that. OK, so this would be, um, yeah, I think this would be a great one. If you're a PhD student, this would be a great one for the uh, the Routledge Roundtable. So uh, if you can find a Commonwealth angle now, if it's uh, corruption and uh, nepotism if it's just a political leadership in uh, abstract uh, things uh, then if if you can uh, if you can make a proposal for a paper that would be comparing uh, Commonwealth countries uh, will be written from a perspective of a, compare, a Commonwealth country. It doesn't have to be the topic of your PhD. It can be a paper that you write as part of your PhD and then you get funding for it. It's basically a commissioned research paper that will be published uh, if approved by peer review to uh, in this Routledge journal that's called a roundtable. And you also produce a podcast about it and uh, promote your work. So, and you get mentorship to do this uh, this work. So this could be a good topic for that if there is a comparative angle uh, to this uh, politics topic that was put in the chat. Um, Natalie, do you have any questions or something? I can't see any questions on the chat. Okay, so there are still just a few just in terms of um, just how does somebody get involved in terms of membership if they have not been part of a member before? Can they go to your website? Do they have to? Um, how can they go about that? Yes, they can go to our website. There's a join us button on the website and uh, they'll be able to apply. Uh, to join the ACU and be very welcome. You know, uh, eligible universities will be any universities who have been around long enough to have graduated a cohort and uh, to have a minimum number of about 250 um, full-time equivalent uh, students um, in, in their campuses and um, basically as yes, committed, of course, to the values of uh, basic values of democracy and uh, respect for one another and uh, building a better world in general uh, as part of the, the Commonwealth. But uh, this is uh, for Commonwealth countries only. We do have uh, 
in our membership um, universities that are not based in countries uh, that are current members of the Commonwealth. We would call them legacy members because we've been around for longer than the Commonwealth and countries may come and go uh, from the Commonwealth. But if they were already our members, we can keep them. So we have members in Hong Kong and other countries that might have been a member of the Commonwealth before, but are not currently. But to join your country, it has to be a member, one of the 56 members of the Commonwealth. Okay, so it has to be one of the 56. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then, um, so I think that actually asks one of the uh, questions of, you know, please, is it required to be a member of the Commonwealth before applying? And in this particular case, it would be so. Yes. Um, it is, is it required? I mean, um, as a country or as, um, because if you are, you know, I noticed that in uh, the registration list for today, there were uh, people who uh, said they were based in other countries that are not Commonwealth countries, like Japan or Colombia even. And I would say if you are a student or a member of staff, professional services or faculty, in a um, university that is a member of the ACU, then you can apply for the opportunities that are available to members, regardless of your nationality. If you are a citizen of a Commonwealth country or you have refugee status of um, in, a, in, a, in a Commonwealth country, one of the 56 Commonwealth countries, then you're also eligible apply, to apply for the Commonwealth Scholarships and Fellowships Plan uh, opportunities, including the Commonwealth Scholarships Commission, which is the um, the UK Foreign uh, Office and uh, Foreign Development Office. If that answers your question, yeah, no, as a person and or as a university, yeah. I think it definitely does answer um, from both sides. And then just another quick question. It says, here, do you provide funding if one has an accepted abstract to join and present a paper at a research conference? So my understanding is this person has been accepted, but will there be some sort of travel mobility grant uh, in order for them to, to present this type of a paper? Yeah, that would have to be through the cycle that we have every year. So we have um, we have opening uh, calls, I know opening dates and closing dates. They're going to be published very soon for, for this year. And uh, what we do is um, these early career conference grants. So if you are an early career researcher who has this paper accepted and normally, yeah, it would uh, be within seven years. Like I said, now I put it on the chat of your or your your PhD or if you're still doing your PhD, uh, if you are employed, so that there are some conditions. We'd have to be more specific about that, but there is funding to support uh, attendance at conference for early career researchers uh, under these conditions and eligibility requirements. Thanks very much. And then just in terms of Yata, um, with regards to the, the toolkit, so anybody um, can access this onto the website and they can download it and then it would be professionals that could use it, any member university, anybody that's looking at trying to connect, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, fantastic. And Come also um, we are available, we are, we are looking for funding to do this, but we, are, but we, we also would be really happy and available to, to provide um, workshops, facilitations, either online or in person, and together with Michelle and Pinky um, to, to actually um, uh, run those, um, some of those tools, which and, and also decide, help, help groups to decide which of the tools would be most appropriate for, for their collaboration and run them with them and facilitate it. It's just that we have to find funding for that. So if universities would like to do it, um, then um, we are open to 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 help with the facilitation of those tools. And then they will just be able to get in contact with you um, via yes. email? OK. Via email, yeah, absolutely. So we will let people know that they can do that. Fantastic. Um, Kamakhala, I see there are a few more questions coming in. Um, so uh, is a voice note. I think we can listen through. Somebody didn't want to type in a question, so I think we should try and. No, there's nothing substantial coming from that. Uh, so, but there's a question from. Uh, I'm doctor from Burkina Faso. How can be a member to benefit any opportunities. Can somebody from Burkina Faso apply for any of, of opportunities? 
Yeah, I'll put a list of Commonwealth countries here. Now, uh, I think it might be useful, yes, to to have this. Not we don't have um, representation and like members in every country of the the Commonwealth at the moment. But every member country of the Commonwealth is eligible. Uh, every university that is eligible to apply to us has to be based at uh, a country of the Commonwealth. So I'm going to put here the member countries. I think it might be might be useful in that sense. So we just, yeah. I am sorry, but if they uh, join the Commonwealth, yes. But uh, at the moment, yeah. No. Is there an age limit to any of most of the people in Africa? This. In terms of maturity, people get their PhD at a mature age. So is there limitations in terms of how old one has to be? And do you take that into consideration if you're from an African institution? Yeah, no age limit. There's no age limit. Yeah, we just it's just the, the career uh, early in their careers, the career level for some okay. of them. Uh, but for others, you just have to be um, a member of the network or community and they're open to anyone for joining. Excellent. So I don't know if there are any more questions or on your side, Carmel. No, if there are any questions at a later stage, um, please let us know and we'll be happy to address it. I do see somebody has put their hand up. Um, normally the mute function is not uh, working on guests. Um, however, we can try um, to see if we can unmute. Unfortunately not, we can only do a camera. So if we can ask that person to please put their question in the Q&A section, we will be able to address it with our presenters. Um, alternatively, if you'd like to let us know a little bit later, we can also do that. Um, but yes, so the slides will be available and we will circulate that from our side. And then, of course, the session is recorded. And so we're happy to share that with everybody um, on our website. And big thank you to Gialia Anna as well as Beata for presenting it. I think it was a very enlightening session because I do think that a lot of people that have joined um, were maybe not as aware um, that they will be able to uh, apply for these types of opportunities and grants. And also on the toolkit side, I think it's a very useful tool for institutions to use. And it's it's great to know that you are also um, open to doing collaborations and facilitating and offering more support. Um, there was one other question just about a person I know that was doing a research in Europe, but we're wondering if they could still apply if they're a part of a Commonwealth University. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, I would have to see what they're interested in now. So we have um, our members in Europe, um, the UK, um, Malta and um, we also have, um, sorry, Cyprus uh, in the UK. So they would have to be um, yeah, hosts, I suppose, for uh, for one of these opportunities. But as part of our programs also, there are eventually opportunities that open up or with collaboration as well. So our, our, our funding is very open. Most of them now will have no discipline attached to them. They would have topics that are uh, in connection with the Commonwealth. So you'd, you, you'd have to say, you know, if you want support for a collaboration that you have already in place, or if you want to join networks and then um, have a, a conversation and then start a collaboration. And then we also recommend that this collaboration is built on sound, sustainable and equitable basis. But uh, from our side, it's just very open, the support that we give. And uh, where there is a thematic um, interest connected to it, it will be very clear as well. So it's hard to speak in a very abstract terms. Like, are there opportunities in Europe? Then you would have to uh, to see whether you want to study, and then you would have uh, opportunity to study in the UK as a result of um, uh, being in a Commonwealth country, being a Commonwealth citizen for the Commonwealth uh, Scholarship and Fellowships Plan. And uh, in other places as well, you know, there might be uh, scholarships being uh, hosted by um, Malta or uh, Cyprus uh, through their governments. And uh, you would have to uh, go to the website. I'll just put uh, Commonwealth Scholarships and Fellowships plan here as well for other countries in Europe if there are hosting 
um, than you'd be able to see. Fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. So thank you. And I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. And I'd just like to say thank you again very much to our speakers. Dr. Nyatt, as well as Dr. Vyatso, for really joining us. Um, and we really do hope that everybody had a good session. Thank you to my colleagues, Kamakhilo and Luther, as well, um, also for all your help. I see people are still putting up their hands. I'm going to ask everybody to please, if uh, they do have a question again, please just um, add it to our chat, and we will be able to address this later to our, our guest speakers. So thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a fantastic day. And we hope to welcome you again to, to the African Doctoral Academy Masterclass sessions. So thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you so much. Good day to all. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.